All right. Um, so we are at the top of the hour. Hello, every welcome. Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's um, virtual training. Um, my name is Gabe Perigine, and I'll be the host for today's event. Um, I'm pleased to welcome today's speaker, technical fellow, Guido Hoffman. Before we get started, um, I do have some housekeeping items to cover. Today's event will be recorded and made available um, after today's session, and I'll share the details of that um, at the end. Next, we'd love to hear from you during today's presentation. If you have any questions for our speaker, please feel free to submit them through the question and answer panel, and we'll get to those um, towards the end of today's session. Um, without any further ado, I'd like to kick things off by welcoming Guido. Um, Guido, take it away. Okay, thanks a lot. Let me uh, quickly share my screen here uh, to get us started. Okay, um, so yeah, I'm uh, I'm Guido Hoffman. I'm going to be the presenter here for this for this session on progressive web apps, which is a fairly you know straightforward topic, but it's still interesting and there's some meaty stuff to to talk about. I'm a technical fellow at TechSoft 3D. I'm with the company for a very long time, <laughs> over over 20 years. Around eight of those years, I've been mostly uh, dealing with Hoops Communicator in various roles and uh, and capacities. And yeah, if you can, if you want to reach out to me with any questions, you can always uh, uh, send me an email at guido.techsoft3d.com. For this session, there's a starter project. You've, you hopefully you've seen it in the email. So if you want to follow along with, uh, with some, there's going to be some coding. We're going to look at source code and we're going to build up this progressive web app from this uh, initial starter project. So hopefully you get a chance. So if you want to follow along, you, you should you should uh, just clone or download or, uh, this this project, this public project from GitHub. Uh, as, uh, as uh, Gabe mentioned, if you have any questions, uh, you should just ask them in the chat. I'm trying to get to them. And hopefully, I can remember to, to, to monitor the chat. Or you can, if you have any additional questions later, or if you have any, any related topics you want to discuss, please go to our forums. We really kind of, we're really big about the community. Gabe knows all about that. So any kind of additional dialogue you want to engage in, any, any follow-up things, just go to our forum and, um, and talk about it, about it there. Okay, so let's get right into it. Um, let me just quickly move on to the next slide here. So quick overview of what we're going to talk about in this, um, in this uh, seminar. I'm going to give you a quick introduction of this starter project. It's a very simple uh, node application, uh, just to kind of uh, that we're on the same page. Then uh, we talk about offline storage first. So how do you actually uh, uh, get make something, create something that's, that you can store offline in the browser. So if you're losing internet connection or the connection is slow, you can access it directly. That's kind of the prerequisite for having this progressive web app, which we then talk about in the next in the next topic. So there's more rigmarole to do to turn this like application that where you can have the data offline into an actual progressive web app that you can install and run locally, just like any other application almost. Uh, we talk a little bit more about this deployment considerations. There are certain requirements um, on the back end you have to fulfill in order to actually uh, serve up such a progressive web app, uh, mostly around HTTPS. And then at, towards the end, we go into a little more of an event topic. Now you have a progressive web app that is almost like a real application, but now if you want to turn it into a real, real application that actually runs natively as a mobile app, there's a technology that allows you to do it. It's called Capacitor. It's, it, we're going to touch on that. We're not going to fully fully implement this, but it's it's an interesting topic, and I think that a lot of people are asking about this. And then there's going to be a final wrap up, and uh, hopefully there's going to be a lot of interesting questions and in the time uh, that we have at the end for uh, Q and A. All right, so let's uh, move on. So let's look at the start so startup project again. Clone or download it from this location here. Maybe I can let me. Um, Actually, uh, I should have done this before. Sorry about that. it in the chat. So yeah. Oh, oh, you already did. Okay, yeah. great. Fantastic. So, uh, okay. So, start a project, a very basic Node Express application. I'm going to be going to look at it in a second. 
has it's basically it's it's just a server client application the free endpoints one to query the list of models that the server has and then and then two others to actually download those models to the client and and you know that it's very straightforward but it does simulate a little bit a real world scenario where there's a server side application where people are uploading models to the conversions are happening on the back end that's not part of this, this demo here, but that would be in a real world application. And then, and then various clients want to access that data and that's dynamically changing. So, and so on the client side, the viewer basically queries the list of files on startup. And then there's these, there are these two REST calls that the client uses to first download the images so that there's an image preview and we can display the list of files and then actually download these SCS files. Okay, before we drive into the code, just a little aside, talking a little bit about the differences between SCS and, and stream cache. You know, this is a, this is a session about Hoops Communicator and it's uh, that is generally an interesting topic and it really pertains to this, uh, this progressive web app. So we have to use SCS. Just as a quick reminder, SCS is our file-based storage format versus a stream cache format, which uses a server backend. And, just to lay out the differences. There's very clear advantage. Initially, Communicator started out just with a server and just with this streaming component. And one of, one of the big things, big advantages that we touted, it allows you to essentially re read these huge files with view-dependent streaming, on-demand streaming that gives you really full, like on-demand access to the data on the server. So the server intelligently streams the file based on the camera position and other factors. And it really, it really allows you to deal with very large models. The file-based approach, it's a little bit different. We've iterated on it. It also gives you now the ability when you use a shattered SCS to have some kind of dynamic uh, streaming as well. So it, but really the full advantage of streaming and dealing with these huge models, you only really get when you're using the stream cache format. You also get a smaller memory footprint on the client because the server can, can leave some of the data, maybe a small screw that's somewhere that's hardly visible, leave that on, this, on the server unless it's actually acquired. And in, in an advanced mode, you can also actually unload data and reload it back. So if, you, if there's memory pressure, you can push some of the data out of, out of memory and then load it back in as needed. And of course, you know, if you really want to get sophisticated and you have the kind of server infrastructure for it, you can also with one line of code switch to SSR and then now you do all the, all the, all the rendering actually on the server. So clear advantage, but there's also some disadvantages mainly on the deploy on the infrastructure side. So you obviously you need to have the whole server side backend becomes more complex because you're not dealing with files anymore. But now you suddenly have like a stateful server, you have basically one connection per user, and you have to manage that somewhere on the backend, right? And you know, for the purposes of this of this seminar, you know, I think it, you also can't leverage the client side caching in the browser. So this this caching that happens to some extent automatically when you download files, that of course doesn't work when the data comes through, like in this case, in the stream cache case, through web sockets. And so that's a clear disadvantage, and that's why we're using this with the SES now for the progressive web apps. Luckily, you can have the best of both worlds. All you need to do is like, uh, if you convert the CAD file, you convert it to the stream cache and the SES format. And then in the case, and then, you know, it's kind of like the Netflix model. If you're online, you want to watch a movie, you stream it. But sometimes, you know, if you have with your kids and you, you, you know, they, they annoy you, you can also just download, download uh, a movie to your, to your device and then load it, load it uh, and then view it without an internet connection. Similar here. You, you, if your application is smart enough, it can basically switch very easily uh, between these two different uh, these two different formats and and streaming methods. Okay, that was a quick whirlwind tool about SC and SES, and now let's get a little bit into the into the code. Let me switch here um, to show you just a, a very rough overview of the startup project, which is again super simple. On the back end, there's just a simple Node Express application listens on port 3000 and you know all the and and has essentially free endpoints as I discussed you know again this is one of them it gives 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 the client a list of models that are currently available and the two others actually pull the data down as a binary blob and that can then be viewed in the viewer if you see here at the if you look at the implementation here sorry about that it's super straightforward no fancy database connection it just looks into a directory gets the list of files and and spits that out to the to the client as a, as a json uh, 
JSON um, data. And uh, with SES, you know, it just reads the files and brings them down to the client, really like a very minimum application. And on the client, it's just the standard viewer. It's just a viewer but that, you, that you get when you download our, our communicator package, plus a little bit of code to actually view the files. So you see that here. Uh, it's just, uh, it's very basic on startup. Um, it, it's, so we, we're using a, a little uh, extra uh, a, a, a library here called tabulator, which just creates like a little nice little table for viewing files. It's, kind of, it's a useful, useful little open source library. And it just displays the name of the file and the, the image associated with it. And on, on, the, on startup, it retrieves the file list with this little fetch call here. And then it displays it here, just again by by fetching each image separately and then displaying it in this table. And if user clicks on one of those on one of those images, which happens here in this callback, it just you know loads that file via our load subtree from SES buffer call. So it gets the buffer buffer data, the binary buffer data from the server, converts it to an array buffer, and then it displays the data on the client. And we can uh, take a quick look at this here. Uh, let me bring up the browser actually and well first of course we need to run this application you just if you if you follow along if you if you download the package of course don't forget to do npm install first to download all the uh, to install the dependencies and then all you have to do is npm start the, the server runs the files get served up and then if you're going if you're going back here to the browser you should see uh the viewer here on the right, you see this, the list of files. These are these models are on this are already on the server. I can pre prepared everything, and so if you click on one of those models, it will bring them up and view them in the client. So that's where that's the starting point of uh, of the application. Now let's get to the actual meat of it here. So let's get back to my slides here and uh, offline storage. So the first thing that we're going to do is implement the ability to store your data offline, to basically cache those, 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 those images, those preview images, as well as the actual SES files in, in, in the browser cache. And we leverage index DB. There's different methods to do caching uh, in, in, in the browser. Obviously, you can have cookies. You can, there's, there's other ways to do it. But for the purposes of this and to basically uh, to be able to access these files on, is the, the, the general method that we're going to use is, is index DB. And that's basically a, da a database. Uh, uh, but that is a little, you know, it's a little bit like SQL, but it is, it has the API is not the easiest to use. That's why a lot of people are using, have, have developed uh, various front ends for it that makes it a little more, more manageable and, and easy, uh, manageable and easier to use. And we, in our case, we're using Dexy here, which is again, a very simple, can I have a little link here that shows it to you. So uh, it's just a minimal wrapper around uh, index DB that make it a little easier to use. And if a few function calls, you can basically create your, create your database and your, and your records. Um, okay, going back here. So what we're gonna do now in this next, uh, and I'm showing you this shortly in the code, is we're gonna industrialize Dexy, create this connection to the database. Then in the code itself, we're going to check if the if these if these images or the SAS files if there is essentially a record of that of the of the model in the database. If there is, we can just pull the data directly from the database. We don't have to do any connection to the server. If there's not, we need to still do the fetch the first time, and then we store it in the database, and then it's available for offline use later on. And at the very end, I'm take a quick look at the Chrome Developer Tools to show you where to find this data and how to debug this this kind of stuff. Okay, so let's go jump back into the code here. And uh, so we're gonna basically, what we have to do now is basically turn this very simple app and, and enable it now for, these, uh, for this offline storage use case. And so the first thing we, we do is go to our, the, our startup code and there we have to initialize Dexy. And I'm not gonna, you know, I spare you the typing and making typos. I'm doing a little bit of copy and paste magic here to put this in here. So right here, where we are doing all the all the setup, we initialize Dexy. Very straightforward. We initialize it here, and then we create uh, it's one single table that will be our models, which contains the name of the model. Normally, you would probably have some UID or a unique identifier, but for this purposes of this, we just have a simple the simple name of the model, which which represents the index here. 
then the, the, the SES data, that's this blob of data representing the SES model, and then the PNG, which is kind of the image, uh, image preview data. So now let's, uh, so we have this initialized. Now we need to do this extra work. Uh, well, so we're still querying the model is to, to actually uh, store this, this, uh, these models and the images in the database. We don't change anything here. We are still querying the model data for now. So we, there's still a server required to actually retrieve these, this information. But then in, when in the model table, in this function that actually displays and updates the table of models, that's where we're going to make some make a change here. I'm going to just do again a little bit of copy and paste and then go through this code here. Uh, so here, so what we do now as we go through this list of models here in this simple loop, we query, hey, is this, does this model already exist in the database? If not, then we have to fetch it, still fetch it. We get the PNG and data from this model. And then we basically update this model in the database, including like the image information uh, as well. If the, if the model is already there, so the next time around, we basically just just get this uh, the image blob directly from the from the result of the of the database query, and then we can just as normal uh, create uh, create the image. I mean, this little bit rigmarole to actually turn the image blob into an into a URL. That's really all that happens here, and then we add this model to the table. Now, on the load model side, when, when the user actually clicks on one of those table entries and wants to download the model, we have to do kind of the knowledge essentially the same thing here. So again, I'm turning, magically turning this function here, updating that in here. So again, we're clearing the model, the previous model out. At that point, again, we look at the database. Hey, do we have the SES data, or data already in the database? If not, we still fetch the data from the, from the server and we turn it into a blob and then we update the database uh, database entry with that SCS information. Again, very straightforward. And if it is already there, we can just get that blob directly out of a database and then all there is to it. Uh, we just turn it into this error buff again and reload the model. So really, really super, super straightforward. One little minor thing we do before we can run this and we're really already almost done here. Uh, we, we need to would be good to actually have put some additional column in our little table here that actually shows us if a model is on online or offline or not. I'm just going to add this here as well. Just need to give me one second. So I'm just a minor update to the constructor here that adds this additional column to the table. That's a little checkbox that tells us if the model is already offline. And you see, and then. Um, you should be seeing this here. Uh, ba -bum, ba -bum. Let me double check. Update model table. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And in here, that's where these two lines are come in that basically say, hey, the model is now downloaded and we're updating, updating that, uh, that offline checkbox in here as well. Great, so I think that's it for, for the most part. Uh, oh, one thing we have forgotten, we also need to, obviously we need to include this Dexy, um, Dexy library into our, into our viewer. We do this here at the very end. I, you know, this, uh, so I, I already included it in the project. So, you can, so all you need to do is add this, uh, this additional script, script entry here. One, one of the prerequisites for progressive app is that all the data needs to be directly accessible. So we can't use a CDN here. Uh, so we always have to make sure that all the libraries are actually in our in our viewer project, which is the case as, here as well. Okay, so I think we should be ready to go. Let's make sure everything is saved. And so if we now go back into our, uh, into our project and run the viewer, so here, looks kind of the same, but now we have this additional offline entry here. So now when I click on a model, that model is now is, is now local. So we have that checkbox here. And if I now reload this, the, the, uh, the viewer, you see that that checkbox is still there. That means the data is now available offline. So if you have a big model, Every, it, 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 and that is true for the images as well. So it won't actually connect to the server for any of that. So if you click on it, it will write, it will pull this data right out of the database. 
very straightforward, very easy. If you want to debug it and take a look what's actually going on behind the scenes, you can go to the Chrome developer tools and actually look there's a and go to the application tab in here you can see the content of this index DB. You open that up you see we have uh, for this for this website here we have basically this models table with uh with the free entries for the for the free models those are all getting created only one one of them right now has the actual so and, and they have they all have the png blob let me make them just a little smaller here which shows that this, all the images are also local and don't need to be downloaded. And then for one of them, the micro engine, which I clicked on already, we also have the SES data blob. So great. So now we have essentially an app that's already doing doing caching, which is which is pretty good. And it gives us more control. With this SES data, you could just serve these SES files directly and, and, and take advantage of the internal browser caching. But this one gives us more control. And again, in the context of a progressive web app, it's really a pre prerequisite that we manage our own, own cache. And so, for example, you could also obviously you can push data out of the cache. You can update the cache as needed. So it's a lot better than relying on the browser caching in, in any case. But in, specifically for the progressive web apps, it's really important. Okay, I think yeah. So we have this part uh, that's done. Let's go. Let's quickly go back to the slides here. So, uh, so the next step is to turn this into progressive web app. And the important thing here is that app has all the data up downloaded. But if you want to access the app itself, you still need an internet connection, right? If you click on the app, if your internet is down, uh, it it will not load because it's still residing on the server. And while the data is, is local on the client, the actual HTML, CSS, and all the other related, uh, related elements, the, image, the images for, uh, for the application itself, they are all on the server. So we need to make sure we need to get those basically on to the client. And so there's a little bit of like incantations you have to make, follow like a certain pre-required step that you have to take to, in order to make this app, turn this app into a real progressive web app. First, you have to create a manifest, which is kind of similar to how you create like this little, this little initialization manifest for like a mobile application, for example, which contains some data about the application. Uh, then you have to create this web worker that has two, that, that does two things. It first installs, essentially installs the application locally in the browser. And then when the application runs, it automatically reroutes all requests to these individual HTML files, CSS files, and images. So everything that the application requests that is not part of our like SES or PNG data, uh, it reroutes that to the local, to essentially the local storage. Um, and uh, in order to do that, it needs to kind of query this file. It's a file. It needs to some information of which files the app consists of, and we go into that in a second. And then you all, all you have to do is link this manifest, uh, register the web worker, and and then you're good to go. And in the app itself, the only real change we have to make on the client is we is check if the app is in which mode the app app currently is if, if it's a, if it's online if there's a connection we still want to mean we still obviously want to connect to the server because we want to get the updated file list maybe if something has changed maybe we have uploaded more models but if it's offline we we don't want to make any queries to the server we just want to kind of use whatever data we have available locally okay so let's go back into the code um Oh, let me just see, I see some chat. Is there, is there any questions already? Again, if, I encourage you guys, if you have any questions or anything in between, I'm going to happy to jump in and yeah. But I'm assuming everything is clear. So, okay. So now let's turn this into a presser background. And we start with creating this manifest file. So I'm just going to do this here. That needs to basically be part of your of your application on the client. So we're just creating a new manifest here. That's a JSON file. Creating this here. And uh, I'm just doing again a little bit of copy and paste. This is how that file has to look. Again, it's a very specific structure. Give its name. I just called it test here for now. You provided some icons. It's again very similar to a mobile app. You won't usually want to have some up some icons representing this application if it's on the desktop or as part of other applications. Thankfully, I already created these items for you. you have, uh, they are part of a data project in that image folder. It's two different sizes you should to provide. And then the, the most important thing is obviously the start URL. In this case, viewer.html. 
and uh, some other information, scope, we don't really need to worry about that, uh, that too much here. So that's really all there is to get uh, uh, the manifest working. So now uh, to the to the web worker. So I've, so let's uh, that's the that's the other part again. The web worker that is responsible. That's a separate thing that runs uh, when when the application gets when when the viewer or this application gets kicked off, and ensures that the app is installed locally and all the requests are rerouted to the right place. So again, we're gonna create this web worker and we and for for uh, we have to create this here at the root of the. Of the of the client application, we just call it web worker. Uh, let's call it worker JS here, and uh, in here, that's among, that is, you know, that Google is your friend here. It's some standard code that people usually write to create this, and uh, that again has these two parts to it: the installation part and the fetch fetching part. Everything is pretty cookie cutter. The important thing here is when the app initially opens, we need to tell tell the browser essentially what files we want to cache. And the browser doesn't know, right? Because all, not all the data is already on the client. You know, maybe I'm accessing some need some file later, depending on which page I'm navigating to. So that and we really need to store the information where the which files we want to cache here and. We have a bunch of files. You know, the viewer, the default viewer, has all these different images. It has a bunch of CSS files. There are there's dozens and dozens of files that need to be stored, and so it, it's it's kind of cumbersome to have like an individual file list here that might also change in the future. One approach would, of course, be to do some kind of pa packaging application to you, uh, Webpack or something like this to turn this to. to uh, to, to condense the app, but for debugging purposes and for some other use cases, the other approach is to actually ask the server for all the files. But obviously, we know all the files that are in the public directory, and we can easily query that. So we are creating a new API entry here on the server called files to cache, which we still have to write, which essentially just receives a file list uh, from the server that contains all the information we need to all the files that are part of this uh, that, that part of this application. Okay, so let's let's write this uh, this function. So this uh, so we go basically go in here in the router. We create one additional API endpoint here called files to cache, and then in our controller where we have uh, where we're creating the actual code for these endpoints, we need to basically create some additional code that that does the caching. And again, I'm not going to write this out. It's a little bit, you know, there might be better ways to do it. But what this is basically doing is recursively iterating to the public folder here in our project and really spitting out each and every single file and putting it into a long list. It's doing a little bit of massaging here that is required to make the, that web worker happy. But what we end up with here is basically a list of all files that make up the application that all need to be queried by this web worker in order to, to pull them down and install them locally. Okay, so we have this, if this is a place, uh, saves this out. We got the worker here, that's, that's, that's querying the cache. Um, that's, we all, and we're almost done at this point. You know, all we need to do now is uh, we have to actually link this manifest that we created in the beginning. That has to be done at the very top of the application, just here. Okay, that, that JSON file needs to be linked back. And then we also have to install the service worker itself. Uh, that we, we can do on this onload at the very start of the application as well. We're just adding this additional piece of code here. Make sure that uh, again, takes our worker file and, and essentially not installed, but registers, registers it with the, with the browser. And with that in place, we now have basically turned the application into a progressive web app. So I've, if he saves this all out and runs this again, let me see if I missed any. Oh, that, there's one thing that we still need to do. As I mentioned earlier, we also want to act on the fact that the application is either online or offline. So now we need to actually go into the client here at the very top. And so for that, we just create another variable here that allows us to keep track of that. So 
So this is navigator object basically tells us if an application is online or not. So we, so we query that at the very beginning at the startup. So we know, hey, now we're online, hopefully, great, uh, or not. And, and then when we get the model list, we need to basically look at this again. Instead of just querying the model list once, we are now in an interval checking just format this a little bit here. Hey, we're checking, has, has our online status changed? You know, I've, did, we, uh, did we go from online to offline or from offline to online? If that is the case, we basically want to update the model. If you're offline and we're not back online again, we obviously need to query the model list again, because again, it's something might have changed in the meantime. Some other user might have uploaded some files or some other things have changed about the data. That's what we do here. If we go from online to offline, we want to update the list and only, and in this, in our case, we only want to show the files that we actually have available offline because we, we might have not clicked on some of these other models. Okay, so this is all in place now. And then in the actual code that, that gets a model list, which, was, which just did a fetch before, we also now put some additional, a little bit of additional code in here. Let me do this quickly. It gets a little more complex. Now we check, hey, we're online. Let's fetch. Let's, let's make sure we get the updated information from the server about these files. If we're offline, then we just all we can do is query the database. That tells us basically all the models that we already download that are already available on the on the client locally. And that's what, and we're only gonna show, uh, and, and from those models, we're only gonna show the models that actually have the SES files because there's really no point in showing models where we do the clicks on it that we can't actually display the model. All right, well, that's already more or less it. So from this, from this, uh, uh, point here. So let's save this all, make sure it's working. And if we now go back to the application and reload, let's see, ta -da. you see nothing really has changed from this perspective here. But now what we have is an additional button that allows us to install this application now locally. So I'm not going to do this now because there's still one other requirement that we need to do to actually make this really work in the general context. Uh, but let me go back now to the developer tools and show you, we still have the models, they're all still in the database, but we also now have this, have this, this local cache storage. This is where the browser basically stores our website. And it should have updated that with the model information, but maybe there is some, is, let me double check that this actually, well, I think, that might have not been refreshed correctly. Let me maybe run this again. But uh, let me see this. I'm not sure where this didn't look. Let me double check. There might maybe we made some mistake here. Let me double, let me quickly do a test here. Oh, oh looks like there is some issue. Um, well, while you're working on that, Guido, there is a question yeah. that came up. Yeah. And it, it had to do with, I'll just let you kind of work on the code, but it had to do with, with checking in and out uh, features of a, of a PDM. And so uh, a common workflow is you have your CAD data somewhere. It could be in, in a PDM solution or a PLM solution. And yeah. that those CAD files are the the main truth of, of your, um, you know, they're, they're what you have designed and you can check those out, but, but you notice even here, Guido showing an SES file, those CAD files need to be converted to a, a viewable format for this web viewer, this, this thin client side web viewer. And so what you need to do is convert each of those CAD files to either an SCS or an SCZ file. And that's what you what you're able to view. Now you you can manage that relationship of checking in and checking out. And the the main way in which we interact with those files is mostly for viewing. So not really an edit workflow. You can still check out the CAD file, open it up in a CAD solution, make your edits, and check it back in. At that point, you would need to create a new SCS file or SCZ file 
and then be able to view that um, in the web viewer, view those changes. Yeah, and and uh, so I, if I understand that right, so yeah, the whole workflow of updating cut files, uploading cut files, converting cut files, I intentionally not included this here, but there's a more advanced project that I, I did before where we also have the cut conversion as part of it. You can you can upload files via via drop zone. That, that it's not part of this, but it certainly is, yeah. I think every the SCS files are, are most their most uh, their main purpose is for, for viewing. So you need to do this. There is there is a conversion step that's that's happening. Now, if anything changes, you need to basically do this cut conversion again. And that obviously has to happen on the back end. The progressive web app doesn't provide that because it's just a browser app. It doesn't have a backend, doesn't have like a native component. And that's why we're talking about the other aspect of it, creating real native apps in, in, as, as, as another chapter. But yeah, I had a little bucket in the code. I forgot to include this uh, this library, this path library here. So hopefully now everything should work. <laughs> Let me uh, reload this again. So now I would hope that uh, if you go back to the developer tools, now everything works. So you see here now the cache contains the actual website, the installable website here. So now you, you should be able to install this and create this uh, offline. This works now for the local host to do this like locally, but if you actually deploy the application, there's one other prerequisites uh, prerequisite for that. So let me go back to the to my um, PowerPoint. Uh, HTTPS. You need to have an HTTPS uh, in a, a server. You need to serve basically your application from an HTTPS server. Uh, so there's. Obviously, that is <laughs> beyond. That is more like a general problem that uh, uh, you know, web uh, web issue that you need to solve. Just one very quick thing I wanted to point you to. If you have, if you're, you know, and, and again, it might or might not be useful to you. There is an application called uh, Glitch. Uh, if you want to very quickly test like a node project, like this one, for example. Glitch allow, does it, you can just upload it from any GitHub, public GitHub repository or directly, and then it automatically runs the node backend for you. It creates an HTTPS enabled server and it, it just works. So no EC2, no Amazon required. It's free uh, for testing. It's, it's a really nice, nice way. But I obviously, I went a little bit, uh, obviously a little bit further and created actually that same application on um, an hour, one of our EC2 instances. Uh, so let me switch to that here as well. That's the application we just created. Only in this case using HTTPS, uh, there is an uh, there is an application called CertBot. If you if you if you're on Amazon, and again you might be already familiar with that, and maybe even more of an expert than me when it comes to uh, web development. But you generally use CertBot to get the, get the certificate, install it. Then the code, this the startup code changes just a little bit. You know, you basically pull in your certificate, and if you have just a when, and if you're not using something like Nginx or something else that already does does everything for you, you just create an HTTPS server here, and then it listens on port. Uh, for for free and yeah that's that's really it so now let's go back to our project and you know i have created i have this so the same viewer that we just built i have this now on an ec2 and you can connect it yourself here using that uh, cobot3d.com that's one of my personal urls i just did this and do not mess with the tech soft stuff here that is basically that is all the server on the back end that is now fully installable and now if you're clicking on this this link moment let's see you should be able oh yeah so that the app is already installed in this case but normally what you would see here install this locally and in this case you open it here and then you basically what you have is is a local application that you can now put on your taskbar that you link that is basically an application that runs standalone and i don't want to do this here but you can now plug out take out your internet, please don't do this as well. But if you take out the internet connection, this app will still work. And all the files that you've just downloaded and that have the X checkbox will run. And you can try this maybe on your mobile device yourself. It's it's the same process. It should come up with a little with a little message saying, hey, do you want to install this app? And you click on it, it installs it, and it will it will run uh, completely as a as a local application. Great. So this all works. You know, it's really it's it's almost distinguishable from a local application that runs in the browser. It's still governed 
by um, you know by the browser. So it's it's still at the, you're still a little bit at the mercy. So in some depending on the platform, for example, I think in iOS, if you're not using the app for a couple of weeks, it will automatically maybe purge it or at least like remove the cache. So you're not you cannot completely rely on 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 being on having ownership of this data. And there's also a certain limit on how much data you actually can put into the index DB. So it's it's great. And I think for that typical use case, you know, for me the ideal use case would be hey you're building some kind of building and BIM application. You want to go to construction site. You have you want to keep keep your data offline for one reason or another. That's ideal, right? So you pull the data down, similar to the approach that we took. You have it available, and then uh, half an hour later, you connect back to the internet, and you can update all your data and keep it back in sync. And of course, and of course, you wouldn't just store the model data. You would also store things like markup or some, you know, comments that people make on models. You would store those locally, and then when the server uh, connection is back there, you would you would upload that to the client. But again, it's completely in the browser. You don't have any access to any of the native stuff, and you're a little bit at the mercy of the browser still when it comes to these progressive web apps. Okay, so um, yeah, let's, let's go back here. So there is a way, almost magical way now, to turn this still web application that almost looks like a like a like a native app, but not quite and turn this into an actual mobile application. And that technology is called Cap Capacitor JS. It's basically, so let me uh, go back here. I think I had a, had a link here. So that's something that, that came out of the Cordoba uh, project from, from, from a few years back. It's basically a very simple thing. It takes an application, your client side application, you, you, you install with NPM, with a few, and with a few lines of code, you basically have an application that it out, and then it automatically creates like an Android or iOS project out of an application that just runs that you can do. There's not much, much else to do that. You have to make hardly any code changes. It, the project essentially just works. So let me um, show you this quickly. So I made that, I did this work uh, before. Here's now that same version of the app, just with a little bit of rigmarole to turn this into a capacitor-based application. So you install, just install a few packages, extra packages here. There's instructions on the website on how to do that. But what you end up with is essentially an Android project. And so I have an Android phone, so I used Android here in this case, but it works just as just analogous to iOS. And you know, and just very quickly to show you this, CS Android Studio running that project that gets that get created with without any kind of extra change, code changes on my end and if you now go to the emulator and you're just gonna maybe let me run this project from here you will see in the browser and there's some css issues so i'm running this now on the in the in the horrid at the portrait mode to make it work but you see that application connecting to this like aws ec2 server that i showed you earlier running now as a native application in the on the mobile device which is pretty cool right so it's and and it's using the and with a little bit of extra work you know you can basically take advantage of the apis that uh, that capacitor provide to for example now don't use store this to all this data and now look in the real file storage of the of the mobile device so you're not limited to how much you can store you can take advantage of other other native apis that give you a lot more control and really allow you to make your application really behave like a mobile app and in addition, you can also create actual native modules that can communicate with your application. So let's say you want to build an application that has converter built in, that uses slip converter or any other native native uh, library that you want to use to do the cut conversion locally. So people can up, can, can directly load a file without having to go through like the uh, the web upload. That is something that is now at your disposal because it's not just a web application. It, it's now an application that can interface with any type of uh, native uh, native component. So really cool and powerful thing and a good way. If you really, if your intention is to write, have one code that runs anywhere, this is as close as you can get to, <laughs> to, to a large extent. And there are other technologies. We always, people ask us about like React Native, for example. React Native has really a slightly different use case. It's more about, hey, write once, run on any mobile device using the native widgets. It's not so much made to applications that are mainly like a, that, that want to display like a web view like this one. 
it's 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 not the idea. This one works a lot. It's a lot smoother for for this particular workflow. If you have a web application and you just want to turn it into a mobile app without having having to uh, to do too many code changes. Okay, let me go back here now to my slide. I did create, if, in case you want to try out this package for, um, for um, it's not, I don't think it's, it's that helpful. If you, have, if you have an Android device, you can actually run this, run this native application um, using this, uh, this link here. Um, and yeah, that's, I've, we are 45 minutes. We are almost at the end uh, of, of this discussion here. So yeah, there's a finished project. Uh, in case you haven't seen it already, it that contains all the code I've just written. You can get that from uh, it's Community Aggressive Web App. It's a solution project. Everything is included in there to make this a progressive for, for the progressive app. Obviously, if you're interested in Communicator and haven't and, and are not already a user, you can get a free trial of it uh, at our website. And yeah, if you questions and comments, call uh, send me an email or join the discussions in our in our forums. All right, that's pretty much it. So now we are open for questions and answers. If you have anything, any questions you want to ask, please shoot. I don't see any in the Q&A, but um, while we're waiting for people to submit questions, um, the recording for this will be available in the form um, that I linked in the chat. That'll be a couple of days before that appears. So just be on um, the lookout um, for that. Um, and if you haven't already, be sure to um, join the community. Um, we post events there, um, have discussions and all of that fun stuff. Um, so be sure to register. Um, and let's see. Yeah, it doesn't look like we have any more Q&A. Um, so thanks, Guido. Thanks, Jonathan, and everyone for joining us today. Um, at the conclusion of this event, there will be a pop-up survey that you guys will see. Please take time if you can to fill that out. Um, that helps us create better content for you. So um, just be sure to give us that feedback. It's super important. Um, thanks for joining us. And we will see you again next time. All right. Thanks. Thanks.